you heading? Some call that catcalling, and in the process of organizing this event, have explained to us that it's actually a compliment. Um, others call that street harassment. Regardless, it's something that many of us have experienced, uh, witnessed, maybe even done to other people, and it's what we are here to discuss tonight. So, welcome everyone to Hey Sexy Discussion and Presentation Night. Um, this uh, event was organized by the University of Guelph's MDRT, that's the Multidisciplinary Roundtable Club. We are an on-campus club that hosts events once every semester to inform students about a current issue um, that's either prevalent in the media sources such as um, newspapers or within Guelph itself. Um, so my name is Courtney, I am one of the executives. Um, we have Mira in the back, she's another executive. Okay. We have Steven. Yes, um, Katie, she's recording right now in the back. And we have Mira, who is going to be updating our event on Twitter. So, before we get started, um, can you raise your hand if you're familiar with the Facebook group Overheard Well? Yes, okay, great. So, if any of you have been following, um, it's a Facebook page where People post things that are just seen around well, and recently we've actually been finding sorry, that um, a lot of people have been posting that they have been getting called out on the street for whatever reason, and typically this is gender based. So um, that is what our event is here to discuss. Someone recently actually posted that they were called fat while they were just walking um, outside. So the tagline for our event was Hey Sexy, but as we do our uh, presentations, try to think about what is fundamentally similar between calling someone out for being fat and calling someone out for being sexy. So with that in mind, I will now introduce our speakers. Uh, first, we're going to have from the campus police, Constable Kyle, um, if any of you are familiar. We will be having from uh, Outline Group, Amber Sherwood Robinson. Uh, third, we will have Sheila Keeney speaking. Um, she is from the Guelph Resource Center for Gender Empowerment and Diversity. She's just in a meeting right now, but we'll be back shortly. And last but not least, Justin Trottier from the Canadian Society for Equality. So, yeah, let's get started. start off here, I was asked for this presentation and when I started looking at it and they were asking about street harassment, one of the main issues is that street harassment is more of a social term, it's not actually a legal term. There's no charge for street harassment, again, it's something that we use as a, as a general term, kind of encompass a lot of different things. Um, as far as harassment on campus, it is something that we see, okay, and I'm not going to tell you that it doesn't happen on campus because it does. Um, we see it from everything from gender to race, religion, sexual orientation, you name it. It does happen on campus. Um, the thing is, it's not always reported, and when it is reported, it's one of those things that it's sometimes hard to follow up on. It's one thing when somebody says, makes a comment to your face, and you can say, I'm who that person was. It's another thing when somebody draws a speak on the wall. It's another thing when somebody writes, you know, you had a senior race on the wall, Matt's gay. Okay, things of that nature. That's not something that's easy for us to address because nobody knows who did it. Okay, and although it's dealt with by us in a serious manner, and it's investigated through its full lengths, sometimes the investigation dies because there is no information to go on. Um, contrary to what some people like to think, we do also see overheard as well. Okay? We don't comment on it, but we do see it, we do monitor it. Um, there are some things on there that kind of trigger us and make us shake our heads sometimes at what's posted on there. With respect to, you know, I remember seeing a post on there about harassment that's happening on campus. The person said, well, why would you call the police? Can't the police are going to do absolutely nothing about it. And they went on this giant rant about how we would not address it, we would not have to call, we wouldn't do anything about it. That's completely not true. Okay, so on campus, there's a different set of rules as there are off campus. In the sense that, and I'll read you a couple different definitions. So, the criminal code defines harassment as, and I apologize for the legal talk, this is what I have to deal with every day, so if you can make sense of it, all the power to you. It says, no person shall with unlawful authority or knowing that another person is harassed recklessly as to whether the other person is harassed, engage in conduct referred to in subsection 2 that causes that other person reasonably in all the circumstances to fear for their safety or the safety of anyone known to them. So 
basically what they're talking about is stocking is defined here as repeatedly following from one place to another, uh, repeatedly communicating with them directly or indirectly to the other person who is known to them, be setting or watching the dwelling or place where the other person uh, or anyone known to them resides, carries their work, business, happens to be, and engaging in threatening conduct directly to that person. So, in essence, under the criminal definition of harassment, simply catcalling is not is not encompassed in harassment criminally. This is where the university definition of harassment comes in. So the university defines things a little differently because it is a campus, so because students all sign these people when they come in here, saying that they're going to the university's rights and regulations, this is what the university classifies as harassment. It says you have the right to an environment characterized by mutual respect. You have the right, so you have the responsibility to treat all members of the university community with respect and other harassment, bullying, or hazing. Harassment is defined as any attention or conduct, oral, written, or virtual, graphic, or physical, by an individual or group who knows or unreasonably know that such attention or conduct is unwelcome, unwanted, offensive, and intimidating. The university is offensive and well harassment against employees or agents of the university for lawful exclusionary duties to be particularly egregious. Basically, you can see how that definition very much varies from the criminal definition of harassment. So, in a situation like this on overheard, a girl's having a bunch of guys surrounding her in a parking lot, they're making comments at her, they're saying, come give me a hug, come give me a hug, I want to get a hug from you, the girl's saying, no, back off, and these guys are continuing to come at her. Does she fear for her safety? Yes. Does she have these concerns? Is what they're saying wrong? Is it concentrated towards her wrong? Yes. Does it meet the criminal definition? I'd be hard pressed. Does it meet the university definition? Absolutely. Okay, when the university definition is met, we can lay a charge, because of this, under the harassment section, one of the documents that went through the judicial process, which I'm sure most of you guys are aware of, for the university to level sanctions against them. I will tell you that in situations where things have not gone to the judicial committee for harassment, they are taken very seriously. Um, and it's sometimes harder for even the judicial committee when you start reading out the comments that are made towards them, and you see all their faces kind of go, wow. Okay, so it is something the university takes very seriously, and they do punish it accordingly. Um, as far as incidents that have happened on campus, one of the best ones is actually at the beginning of this year, I was walking with my partner, we're on foot patrol, we're actually going between Thornborough and South Residence on that pathway there. Walking the pathway, it's about one o'clock in the morning, there's a group of about 25 students standing outside the very pod. They're all standing out there, and as we walk up, one of the males leaves the group, and I see a lone female walking up the path by herself. And this female's obviously coming from a bar, where she's dressed accordingly, she's going out, okay? This guy walks up beside her, and this is right after the mechanic gets his presentation. And this guy thinks that he's being funny, and his friends all start laughing at him. He walks up beside his friend and goes, Can I kiss you? Can I kiss you? Can I kiss you? And the girl looks at him, and you can see the look of terror in her eyes. She keeps walking. This guy, Can I kiss you? I want to kiss you. I want to kiss you. I want to kiss you. And he's walking right up beside her in an intimidating fashion. He didn't see us walking up as well. I stopped the gentleman and started speaking with him. I said, What in the heck are you doing? He's like, Well, it was just a joke. And I look over, and his 25, 20, 25 friends are all laughing. In that group, there's not just males. There's about half males, half females. And the females are laughing as well. So there's a couple different ways that we could have handled that one. And my idea was, this is a really good educational opportunity. So I knew the female was safe. She had gone on her way. I went over and spoke to the group, and I said to him, I said, how do you think you made her feel? He was like, well, it was only a joke. I said, no. I said, how would you feel if you were a little female Walking at night, you have a large male coming up beside you, asking you to kiss you, and repeatedly doing it. I said, that's intimidating. And all of a sudden, you saw the entire group of friends look at it from a different perspective. They all of a sudden started looking at it, well, I think this wasn't a joke, but maybe that girl would be freaked out. I said, you think that girl's going to want to walk along this pathway anymore now at night? Maybe she feels safe on the university campus anymore? By the end of the conversation, the girls who were in the group and the guys were all saying, thanks, we never looked at it that way. Thank you. And you can actually see that they got it. So I think sometimes, it's, it, it, I'm not giving an excuse for behavior of this because it's completely acceptable, but I think a lot of times it's misinformed, and I don't think a lot of them understand the impact that they're having on the behavior. I think a lot of people think that they can just make a comment and somebody's going to brush it off, when in fact they don't realize the long-term effects they can have. On campus, we do offer a couple different things. Um, some of the things we offer are our RAD program for people. Um, a lot of people think this is just a self-defense program. There's actually a lot of personal awareness and self-awareness and safety awareness that we do that. They can help deal with some of these harassment. Um, one of the big things that we talk about in that program is how we word no. And one of the
one of the questions I was asking in the email is, you know, what should somebody do if they're being harassed? You know, what should somebody say? That's really a personal choice, and I'm not going to tell you exactly what to say because you may not be comfortable doing it, it may not work for you, whatever the case may be. One of the things I will say though is the word no. The word no is a very powerful word, it's not something we're used to hearing. In society, nobody says the word no to you, everybody says, oh, I don't think that's a good idea. Right? Nobody actually comes out and says no. So for instance, you're in the middle of a parking lot, and I always give the example, you're in a shopping mall parking lot, somebody comes up to you, they're saying something to you, and you say, get away from me. Get away from me. Nobody's going to look. If you have somebody in the parking lot, and you picture yourself walking to the parking lot, you're going to go, no! Your attention automatically goes, what is going on over there? It's the same situation here. If somebody's bugging you, somebody's harassing you, somebody's constantly making these calls at you, simply yelling out the word no to them, making it known that that behavior is not wanted, will not only probably startle them, but it will actually draw attention to your situation. So hopefully you can have a back. So that is the, that, that's my best recommendation for it. Like I said, some people are comfortable with it, some people aren't. The other thing is, when it's happening, call us immediately. Okay? When you call us two hours later and say, we're just, I'll wrap it up by saying that if somebody does have to call some and you call us two hours later and you say to us that, you know, these guys are in the parking lot, we, it's hard for us to find them. We show up and we're there. Okay? So, like I said, call us immediately if something does happen. I apologize, I got to get called or I got to get a hold of the phone for you. I got to bring you
I'm representing. Uh, my name is Amber. These are some of my privileges uh, and some experiences that I have lived with uh, that contribute to my who I am today and the perspective that I'm coming from. Um, I think most importantly, I'd like to acknowledge that this presentation and the entire university exists on stolen land. Uh, so we are now uh, on the traditional territory of the Adamanaran neutral people whose traditional territory is um, I think any discussion of oppression, which street harassment is, um, is fundamentally linked to its, probably its first form, which is colonialism, and we have to recognize that that still exists today. Um, yeah, okay, so to get started, street harassment. I'm using it sexual harassment in a public space. Uh, so at its core, it's sexually objectifying, but uh, like I said, it's a form of oppression that integrates a lot of, or uh, sees the intersection of a lot of different forms of discrimination. Some of those are listed here, certainly not all. Um, classism, ableism, racism, uh, sizeism, things like that. Uh, but what I'm going to be focusing on today is homophobia and transphobia, uh, as I will be discussing. Um, so the prevalence of street harassment, it is the most prevalent form of uh, sexual violence. It's raised by all genders, so men, women, everyone in between and aside from that. Uh, in a study done uh, by a group whose information I will be using throughout this presentation called Hollow App, who includes uh, or encourages uh, bystander intervention when it's safe to do so, uh, a study done in Ottawa showed that 97% of respondents had experienced street harassment. 10% of those people have reported it. Um, so this issue predominantly affects women. I think we all uh, can understand that, but it also uh, severely affects the queer community. Um, and it's been cited as having a tremendous effect on the um, So queer folks experience this in a much more, in a much higher number, and uh, with greater uh, so the reason for this uh, was mentioned briefly earlier, it can be gender-based, um, which gender is a social construct, uh, so uh, many people identify on the male-female binary, but there are some people who exist uh, in a community between and outside of that. Um, however, a lot of expectations and stereotypes exist on how you present or are assumed to be uh, identified. Um, and those carry uh, such, such stereotypes as feminine qualities include being weak or caregiving, um, masculine meaning not emotional or aggressive. Um, so gender discrimination happens in street harassment through intimidation, assumed sexual availability for females, uh, basic sexism, assuming female inferiority, and gender-based violence. So specific uh, instances in the trans community, which includes gender queer and gender fluid folks, gender non-conforming, um, are violence, both physically and psychologically, harassment, sexualization, fetishization, discrimination, uh, gender policing, and, and overall just a compounded societal pressure to look or act a certain way. Uh, so uh, like I said, trigger uh, language can be used in the description, but one um, when you are transitioning from using the female restrooms to male restrooms, a lot changes. You fear going into female restrooms because women constantly tell you that you are in the wrong restroom. They yell at you and protect their children like you are going to hurt them. See, because as much as we fear that verbal harassment, I now fear the physical assault upon entering the men's restroom. It's hard to confront those who you know or strangers when they say you don't have a penis. This means you are not a man, get out, freak, etc. It's not only the physical threat that scares me when this happens, but the mental damage of constantly feeling threatened or fearing another assault as I choose what uniform to wear any given day. Is it the straight male, the gay male, the butch female that will cause me the least harm? And more so, why must we choose what option of me would like the least harm? Which option would disarm those directly assaulting? Another person added I was walking out of Starbucks and two college age looking guys yelled faggot at me. I am a transgender woman and I have no problem with people recognizing that I am a transgender woman. I am very offended when people 
people call me things that I am not. I was so angry that I threw my coffee on the ground and just got my car and left. Another uh, person in this moment is Tommy Wealth, a uh, very uh, active trans activist. Uh, she explains, I got to the Main Street Bridge when I heard someone say something behind me. I would have turned around no matter what they said, but what they said was, hey, faggot. I turned around to catch a fist in my mouth and I fell hard to the ground. I was brutally kicked by at least three people. I heard at least one female voice and two distinct male voices yelling homophobic slurs. I am still not sure how, but I did manage to scramble to my feet and run. Fractured jaw, broken elbow, fractured ribs, 30 stitches holding my lip together, and another 50 or so stitches uh, on three major wounds, just six months before I could return to work. When the police asked what happened, I speculated they were just trying to mug me. I honestly didn't want them to get caught because they would most certainly out. At that point, I was literally being back. So another um, basis on which street harassment can occur is sexual orientation. Uh, I found a study that uh, proved that females in heterosexual couples, uh, like not necessarily romantic partners, just in pairings out in public, that female is significantly less likely to experience uh, street harassment. Uh, that might seem like a good thing, but it's actually because she's perceived as being protected or owned by that man that she's with. Uh, females who are out together in public are both uh, significantly more likely to be uh, redressed. Uh, so that just shows how gender discrimination and prejudice and sexual orientation intersect. Specific experiences of uh, based by lesbian uh, identified people include threats, assumed sexual availability, uninvited sexual Identification, wanting to join the fun, that's a common one. Um, and this leads to concerns that uh, verbal harassment will escalate. Uh, specifically, uh, Emily says the exact words never matter. It's the idea that you are constantly being watched with eyes of lust and hatred. That's what hurts. Another person, uh, identified as Sandra, says as a woman and as a lesbian, I spend every day of my life. Confined by the consequences of men's belief that it is perfectly acceptable to verbally, physically, and sexually assault, harass, and intimidate me. Another person says, There's always someone who feels like they have the right to do or say whatever they want to you when you're a woman out with your partner. Uh, my girlfriend and I were just walking through the front doors of our apartment building when some red faced guy just barked out lesbian. I turned back to glare at him and he just smeared. He added, I guess I'm jealous. I hate that our orientation defines how people view us and that so many guys see lesbians through the same scope. We are sex objects. I moved in with my partner about a month ago and have since been verbally harassed three times. It is extremely scary and unfair that I cannot navigate my own neighborhood without being called names, yelled at, or experiencing other forms of homophobia. Most recently, there were a group of about five men outside of a bar who call us lesbians times. I told them to stop and to be polite, and they, ever so cleverly, responded with, she must be the masculine one. Uh, gay experiences. Uh, so men and people in same-sex relationships face barriers to reporting, especially uh, because there's a stigma or and evidence of not being taken seriously, uh, being stigmatized and not believed. Uh, specific accounts include Kent, Neil to bag it again, and Brett to be over the head of the bottle we had in his hand. My boyfriend and I were walking into a grocery store holding hands when the people in the car thought it would be a good idea to show the bag. I decided to try and confront the two guys sitting in the back seat. However, my boyfriend was against the idea and the two men, boys, uh, refused to respond to me. My boyfriend and I should be able to hold hands wherever we are. Kevin says we were only a block away from home and a large, intimidating man was walking with headphones on from the other side of the street in our direction. He takes off his headphones as he starts to pass us and mumbles faggots at us, loud enough for me to hear. Thinking neither of us heard him, he called faggots at us again, louder this time, and my boyfriend hears him this time. I quietly tell him not to turn around and just ignore it, but it's certainly frightening and it's discomforting to have this happen only a block from where I live. Uh, so, gender based and sexual orientation based harassment can intersect in general queer identity. Um, that's because a lot of those identities are invisible in public spaces. Uh, looking at me, well, but looking at me, you may not know that I identify as queer. Um, 
and you assume my gender based on how I look, you assume my sexuality based on how I look, and that is um, kind of painful and frustrating and scary for me to not be seen as who I am. Uh, specific accounts, harassers promised to break her until they recognized it was a man and then yelled, shit, it's a guy, suck my dick, faggot. So that, I think, really well illustrates how gender-based uh, breaker, oh no, it's a guy, faggot. Uh, Jessica says, street harassment seems innately disrespectful to the entire LGBTQ community because there's an assumption of your gender and sexual orientation involved. The cherry on top of it all is always being called a dick when you uh, do anything other than express enthusiasm towards your harassment. Uh, Catherine says, I could hear a man muttering to himself as we got on the train at the same time. He was saying I looked like a man. I called him out saying, I don't need to pretend, oh, I don't need any homophobia or transphobia. He said, if you're a woman, you should be a woman. Don't pretend to be a man. As I continued to tell him what he was saying was unacceptable, he acted as if I was not harassing him rather than vice versa. He said not to worry that we were done. I told him that we were not because he needs to know that it is not okay Uh, another person was scared. Uh, they were going to get assaulted for appearing, appearing differently than they should. It happens occasionally, especially to people who appear at all queer. Harassment has made me feel insecure about my appearance and whether I should change the way I present myself. Jen says, uh, someone wants to yell this at her, are you guys lesbians? Uh, I didn't say anything because the non-binary is already My high school years were absolutely plagued with this, to an awful degree. While I proudly identify as queer now, at the time I assumed I was straight and just a bit more masculine than my peers. I was called a dyke, a wig, fat, and the boys would actually, actually ask me out and verbally harass me. Hey, you're so sexy, show us your tits. My ass was also slapped regularly almost every time I had to stand up in class. Since they never did anything worse than that, the teachers treated it the same as they did with minor things like name fault. The verbal harassment and groping I received was ignored, as was homophobia, which, although not awful, has prevented me from coming out to people as an adult. Boys, boys need to be taught that treating women and girls this way just isn't acceptable or funny, but they aren't already is a major educational thing. I think that last point is really um, important and uh, not just to highlight the educational feeling as we move into talking about prevention programs at the University of Wealth. Um, this isn't an error. This isn't, um, I, I do a lot of research when I do a presentation, and these are the prevention programs at the university that are directed towards sexual harassment. Um, there are. The uh, campus police has a crime prevention and safety tips part on their website, and that includes being familiar with where the emergency posts are, and um, if you're walking out in the dark, uh, take well-lit routes and uh, designated pathways, use the buddy system or safe walk, advise your roommates of where you are going and when you should be returning. Again. This uh, really neglects the fact that we need to be teaching boys and men and people in general that treating women like they have been treated uh, or anyone that they don't approve of is not okay. This language is very victim blaming and there's another page on the campus community police's website on sexual assault that continually uses extremely inappropriate victim blaming language and it should not be tolerated. Um, the Department of Psychology also uh, did a study using the Sexual Assault Resistance Education Program to teach first year females uh, in university how to use self defense. Uh, thankfully, your undergraduate student union has taken up this mission on a more serious level. Uh, these are some of the campaigns and programs that they offer to prevent sexual assault on campus. Um, if you would like to know uh, more about any of them, feel free to um, they're really important to get involved with seeing as they're the only way to get involved on your campus and that is something as well. Uh, so the implications for all of
with this, it does have serious negative impact on health overall, uh, psychological well-being and physical well-being. There are studies showing that street harassment can be just as damaging as any other form of sexual violence. Uh, reporting is complicated by uh, intersection of identities. Um, so folks who experience interracial um, harassment may feel uh, a divide when in reporting or um, difficulty reporting because of uh, obligation to their community, feel a sense of um, like betrayal if they were to report it. Um, reporting can also, uh, unfortunately, uh, result in the continued experience of harassment and oppression and trauma. Uh, that being said, I, unlike the um, constable who spoke earlier, do not encourage you to uh, contact police. Uh, as I do not promote criminalization because it is an extremely uh, racist process and system. Uh, it's, it, it includes profiling and uh, disproportionate targeting of people of color, and the justice system itself is flawed. So um, I don't think that we should, um, that that's the focus we should be having. I think the focus should be on prevention based policy and community based. Uh, responses. Uh, the prevention-based policy is really important, especially considering the limit. Yeah, so that's my presentation. I look forward to uh, any questions you may have about it. Um, feel free to think critically about uh, the issue and, and how it affects you. Thanks.
so we are going to have um, a complete discussion uh, part at the end of uh, or uh, sorry, at the second half of our um, discussion tonight. Uh, but first, we're going to have all the speakers speak. So make sure you hold on to your questions, and then um, we'll open it up to the audience. So we're now going to move on to our third presentation. Um, this is from Sheila Key. Uh, she is here from the um, Wealth Resource Center for Gender Empowerment and Diversity. So thank you so much for making it out today. Thank you. Parts of what we do in this course is we 
we understand that, um, that gendered violence and sexualized violence is not just a women's issue, because it's not, right? We have a whole room of people who are here to, to put an end to cat and we're here to put an end to gender violence. And, um, and that's awesome. Women need our allies. Also, we need spaces where we can build the empowerment that we need. Um, and create the spaces that we need in order to congratulate one another, reframe our stories, and walk with a little more power in the world. Or maybe a lot more power, all right? Um, so one of the things that we do is we tell success stories. We have a combination of, of um, sit-down type discussions as well as uh, physical techniques. And the sit-down, and we also tell a lot of success stories, one of which I'll share with you right now. Um, has anybody ever been to Scarborough Town Center? Yeah? Okay, cool. So like a third of the room. Um, and you know that there's not a lot of sidewalks there, right? It's all geared towards car traffic, and therefore pedestrians can feel kind of isolated. Well, that was the case for this one person. Um, she was black, and she was walking uh, towards her mom's office. Um, and this group of five white guys started following her. She said they were about uh, 18, 19. So there's a huge, automatically there's a huge um, imbalance in terms of perceived privilege, right? She's 14, she's black, she's a woman. There's five of them, they're 18 or 19, they're white. They started, they started, it was, I wouldn't call it catcalling, they started harassing her, they started verbally, verbally harassing her. And they started shouting, hey, are you a virgin? And hey, do you want to lose your virginity? What were they threatening to do? Fuck with. They were threatening to rape her. They were threatening to rape her. And if they were willing to rape her, is it possibly is it possible that they would be willing to do something worse to her, to harm her even more? Absolutely. And is it possible if they were willing to harm her beyond that that they would be willing to kill her? So she knew then, just as we knew know now, that she was in a life-threatening situation. This 14-year-old woman summoned all of her courage. She turned around and she pointed to the mouthpiece one and she said, Hey you! Do you want to lose your crotch? And all the guys started laughing at her. And she pointed at the guy who was laughing the loudest and she said, And you! Do you want to lose your nose? And then one of the guys said, What? What are you going to do? Are you going to be us all up? And she pointed at him and she said, No. But I'm going to hurt you real bad. One guy at the back of the group looked at his watch and he was like, Guys, guys, I just remember we have that deal that we have to make. Remember, we have, we have that, that deal. We have to get back to the mall. Come on, remember the deal in the court? Let's go. And so he grabs his friends and he rallied them and then he, he brought them back. She ran crying all the way through her mom's office. And she got there and her mom told her what each of us deserve to hear when we stand up against gender violence. She said, You are so brave. She said, You are so smart. You are so incredible. And so proud of you. She also said, let's get your window open so the fences from their own phone. And so there they were, on two ends of the phone, talking to their self, talking to her self-defense instructor, and her self-defense instructor said the same thing. She said, I'm so proud of you. She said, you are so resourceful. You are so amazing, so kick-ass. Right? Because those of us who experience gender violence in the world recognize that it's a daily thing. And we recognize that, and we need to be, we need to recognize that um, when we fight back, whether it's with our words or whether it's with our fists, that it is a moment of success. A couple years later, this young woman found herself on the stage at the 40th anniversary of our uh, organization. Um, and I'll tell you, there was not a dry eye. She got a standing, standing ovation over 200 women. And I think that's what each of us deserves when we stand up to gender violence. Um, there's a lot of men in the room, so I also want to touch on allyship and how um, important that piece is. Um, I know as I'm, uh, I'm white, and I have recently been called out, called in by somebody who has been, who told me like, hey, you actually have to be acting so really awesome. These are some of the ways in which you, um, you've not been awesome. And I think that it's really, really crucial for those of us who want to stand in allyship to be able to hear that. Right. 
And, um, and so that means listening, and that means apologizing, and that means keeping accountability. So reaching out to, to um, examine ourselves in order to start to challenge the privilege um, that some of us hold. I think that we can be really good at um, fighting back and rebelling against things that, dis that disadvantage us. You know, say I got fired from my job unfairly. It's really easy to get riled and say, you know, and say, hey, that wasn't fair, and to um, and to fight back. But it's very rare that we see people who are actively advocating against their own privilege, and that's something that we need to start doing, right? Because when women experience gender violence on the street, it's not um, no matter how you cut it. If you're a man, you're benefiting. Uh, there's there's a privilege that um, that cisgender men were born, have been born into that they did not earn, that they did um, nothing to deserve, but that they but that they walk there's, there's privilege that they walk into the world with, and um, and so sometimes that means all the time that means learning, but sometimes that also means taking taking knocks, right, and having those uncomfortable, uncomfortable conversations with your guy friends. And um, beyond that, like extending yourself in uncomfortable ways in order to try to level the playing field a little bit in terms of how unfair this world can be towards the men and girls. Um, I think I'm gonna maybe wrap up um, with a piece about um, a piece about alcohol and, uh, and how it plays into into our world. Um, can anybody tell me what the most common day rate drug is? Alcohol. Um, it's often that I find myself, like if ever I'm downtown 12 on a Thursday or Friday night, um, I at least have one intervention in every time I go downtown. Um, I tend not to drink just in case I'm like, I might need it on the and I think that that's something that um, I'm inviting inviting all of us to, to try to do it that, um, yeah, I'm inviting all of us to, to do that, to step in as, as advocates for, uh, for one another. Um, there was one woman who was at a party, um, she was at like, a frat party, and she, um, she got really, really trash, and a guy friend of hers said, hey, yeah, I live around the corner, do you want to stay at my place tonight? Uh, and you know you can stay, you can sleep on the couch, and she said, "Yeah, that'd be great." So they go back to his place, and once they got inside, he pushed her down on the couch, and he was getting ready to sexually assault her. She, in her drunken haste, she dropped her she dropped her thumb into an inside knife hand and brought it up in between these, this guy's legs and smashed him in the top in the testicles. He he buckled over. She went upstairs to his room. She put a chair underneath the doorknobs that he couldn't get in. She slept soundly in his bed. In the morning, she had a headache, but she left. But she left the house and she was safe. It's important for us to remember that it's never, ever, ever, ever about what a woman is wearing. Um, it's never, ever, ever about how much alcohol she chose to consume or whatever other substances she chose to consume. Um, that sexualized body violence is prevalent and is experienced by, I mean, by the majority of women. 98% of women have reported experiencing some kind of sexual violence, whether that's harassment or sexual assault. One in four women will experience sexual assaults in their lifetime. That drops down to one in three Indigenous women. So, um, so there's an inherent risk with being a woman in this world. Um, and uh, oh, it's, it's And in order to act in true allyship, we have to recognize the systemic nature of, of patriarchy and of um, contempt for women in this society. And we all have to be actively advocating against it. So um, I commend all of you for coming up tonight. Thank you so much for hearing me.
I also did want to address maybe a bit of the elephant in the room, and that is men as, as a group. Okay, let's talk about men for a moment. Um, a street harassment and intimidation does happen to men, uh, and I think it can sometimes take different forms, but it's there. I do want to share a personal story. I mentioned the one that occurred uh, to my fiance. Um, there was actually uh, an incident that occurred to me personally. I'm not sure if you consider it um, street harassment. Again, that's something that, that, that I guess we can we can discuss or, or debate. It was uh, more, I guess, street intimidation, if you will. But um, the incident very simply was that I was walking down a rather narrow street to get to my car. And coming down the opposite way uh, was a somewhat larger man. I'm a fairly small person. I'm uh, not one who uh, is probably able to defend himself very well, I'll get in a potential physical altercation. Um, and this man, as I was trying to pass him to get to my car, was clearly moving so that we would have to collide with each other, if you know, just understand what I'm saying, just to be uh, kind of um, intimidating. At least that's how I felt. And so ultimately we did sort of walk into each other as I was trying to navigate around him. And then he turns to me and says, um, why don't you get the hell out of my way? And so as I tried to do that, he's keeping himself in my way. And uh, finally, I had to apologize to him and sort of just walk around him. And thankfully, it, it did escalate. But I can tell you whether that was street harassment or not. It was a terrifying experience for me, and so I can certainly understand uh, that kind of that kind of sense of dread. Um, I also just wanted to throw out a few statistics that we can that we can keep in mind here, um, just in terms of looking at this uh, through that gender-based violence lens. When we're talking about street harassment, um, as I said uh, earlier. There are, it's a minority, but there are men who have experienced this. Uh, I've looked up some of the studies. Um, uh, what they suggest is that about 60 or 65 percent of women will experience some, something in that spectrum that, that we've heard about. Men about 25 percent, about a quarter of men. So it's significantly less, but it's a quarter of men is, is certainly uh, not non-existent. Um, the other interesting figure there was that two-thirds of women and about a half of men in these encounters uh, are concerned that it might escalate. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And the other thing that we've heard is that street harassment exists on a spectrum, which I fully agree with, all the way up to uh, potentially assault. Um, in the public square, which we can think of as an extension of the public street, rates of violence um, against men are actually higher. I'm not talking here about sort of sexual assault, that's certainly higher uh, rates against women, but just assault in general, it's actually higher against men. Um, Statistics Canada 2008 uh, uh, put out there that in terms of physical assaults, um, they're roughly comparable between violence against men and violence against women. The difference, though, was that where they take place, and I thought this was interesting. As I said, I was researching this and I didn't expect this, um, but it turns out that women are significantly more likely to experience violence in a private setting, usually in the home, in a domestic kind of scenario, whereas rates of male victimization in a more public setting, and the examples that Stats Ken gave were uh, bus shelters, parking lots, etc., uh, were actually quite a bit higher for men. This is sort of strange with violence. So the other side of um, addressing the, the men uh, issue is, uh, again, acknowledging that men are, of course, more likely to commit it. And, and so the question is, why is that the case? We sort of take it for granted. But I do want to throw out a few, a few thoughts on this. Um, they may be a little bit provocative, but nevertheless, I think it's important to tackle contentious issues head on, and we can certainly have some good debate later. Uh, some men may do it to prove they're attractive, uh, to show that they're a man. Um, we were talking, you were talking earlier about uh, sort of gender policing, and I think that in this case, we can see that turning into sort of a harmful kind of masculinity, where men feel that in order to be manly, they need to express their manliness in this rather harmful way. I think it might also be for men to show that they can take rejection. Um, Men, uh, kind of part of masculinity in our culture, I think men are socialized to expect um, that in order to enter relationships or to get, um, uh, to connect with women sexually or any other way, um, it, the responsibility is on them to compete for women, to uh, initiate encounters with women, whether that's right or wrong. I think that there is that perception among a lot of men, and this can take a very, um, a very negative, uh, this can be expressed in a very negative way. Um, the last point that I want to make on this is, I'll just throw this out there and then sort of rest my case on this point, is whether the harm that comes from these kinds of socialized, normalized uh, approaches to, to gender in our culture, how, how they harm both genders, in which ways do they harm men, and in which ways do they harm women. I want to throw that out there just for, uh, uh, for debate after, uh, after my remarks.
So what, what can we do in terms of solutions? And I was on the same blog that you were looking at, on uh, uh, org, and, I, and I thought that um, the three A's were a really good approach. But, and, you know, this can be applied, I think, if, if you're a woman who's dealing with street harassment, it's probably something I could have applied to the situation that I was dealing with getting to my car. And the three A's are acknowledging the situation, understanding the, the seriousness of the situation that you're in, assessing the type of uh, harassment that you're dealing with or the nature of the harasser, him or herself, and then acting in a way to communicate in an assertive way, not, a, not an angry and so again, back to communication, which was one of my initial uh, recommendations there. And just lastly, just a few questions. I think I've already posed quite a few, but just uh, two or three more um, to leave you with. Um, the first one is, is there an appropriate way, and if so, what would it mean to communicate interest? Is there a way that you can communicate an interest that you have legitimate interest? Um, again, earlier, that difference between um, uh, legitimately loving something and then objectifying it. How do we communicate? What language do we use um, to, to communicate in an effective way the way we feel about something so it doesn't cross that line? Um, what about other forms of offensive or intrusive speech? Um, what about panhandling? Somebody who sort of intrudes into your life that may or may not be wanted. Uh, somebody that comes up to you on public transit may or may not be wanted. Um, sex workers uh, that, that come up to you, that have come up to me um, offering uh, sexual services that may or may not be wanted. How do we deal with those kinds of things? And again, um, just in terms of, of the gender uh, complexion of all of this, do men and women respond differently to the same kinds of advances? Does the same kind of communication said from man to a woman versus a woman to a man have different effects? Is that a good thing? Should we be aware of that and sensitive to that? Or should we strive and fight so that um, the expectations and the, the appropriate modes of communication are the same regardless of gender? So like I said, I'm not an expert. I just was hoping to uh, throw some new perspectives and, and and some questions out there, but I've been really privileged to uh, hear from my co-panelists. I'm looking forward to your questions and some of the, some of the feedback from the audience. Thank you very much.